Well, dear friends and colleagues, um, I'd like to start uh, by the customary but heartfelt thanks to our hosts, Mark Turin and Mary Cameron, and their very efficient staff for organizing this Himalaya Studies Conference in Yale. It is an extremely great honor for me to be here today, and I'm looking forward to meeting and hearing all the scholars that have been gathered on the occasion. I would like more particularly to express my pleasure and satisfaction at being offered a platform to introduce to such a distinguished audience a small portion of today's creative, creative art scene in Tibet. In Tibet proper, literature and poetry are vibrant, even under today's harsh circumstances, or possibly because of today's, today's harsh circumstances. Literary are the inheritors of 14 centuries of incessant, nonstop writing activity. Films are obviously a much later addition to the art repertoire. Film started in Tibet proper as late as in 2004, but much earlier in exile and outside Tibet. And I'm happy to have Gesang Tseten here as uh, the other keynote speaker because he's a representative of er, this earlier, more experienced group of Tibetan filmmakers outside Tibet. But in spite of this, it, in, and for a variety of reasons I cannot go into today, neither poetry nor films get a lot of scrutiny from Tibetan studies specialists or Himalayan studies specialists. As I hope I will demonstrate today, I believe that these two art forms and other art forms are worth our attention as they enable us to delve into the dynamics of creation under heavy constraints and into the world of intellectual or virtual world of lay Tibetans endowed with strong cultural capital when they address other Tibetans who are similarly equipped. So today I will talk about how Tibetan artists, mainly poets and filmmakers, and to make it short, have been negotiating the representation of the black tent, the abode of highland pastoralists, in the light of the massive wave of resettlement of herders in contemporary China that has gathered momentum in the last decade or even less than that. I will, in my conclusion, reflect upon the social role that these artists can fulfill in today's Tibetan society, if any. So last Sunday, as I was um, doing my usual survey of the Tibetan websites that I've been in the habit of checking every day for the last few years, I came across a very surprisingly frank piece of political opinion from a Tibetan. The author of this uh, paper was, is called Shok Zhang. He's a student from Northwest National Minority uh, Institute in Lenzhou who has been nurturing the most creative and maybe modernist uh, Tibetan intellectuals today. He was detained in April 2010 for publishing a magazine in which he had invited several Tibetan writers and students to express themselves and they're not to give an analysis on the 2008 Tibetan uprising. Anyway, he was released four months later and he has taken, uh, he has resumed his activity as an um, analyst, we should say, freelance. Um, I checked again this morning, about 700 readers have been clicking, have been looking at this post. And that's quite a lot, uh, of, uh, quite a big audience in six days, um, because most posts that I can read um, on the internet receive between 20 and 500 to all together after a few months, but this one has generated 700 you know, clicks in just six days. So that shows you the interest triggered by his paper. So what does he say? He says, in this piece of opinion, um, he expresses his view about the Kunming railway station massacre in which 29 person, persons, and not including the four uh, perpetrators, were killed on 1st of March this year. First, he claims his doubts about the attribution of the act to Uyghur terrorists which is a link which was immediately made by the Chinese media. And uh, he adds that if it were proven, if it were to be proven, proven, then the Chinese government should not be too surprised due to the harsh and discrimin discriminatory policies that Uyghurs have been subjected to 
um, while their history offers proof enough that they have enjoyed freedom for many centuries. From the springboard, uh, from the Uyghur case, which we can see, as a, which I interpret as a springboard, he switches to the Tibetan question. And he asks, uh, he goes on denouncing the resettlement policy targeting Tibetan as a way to under, undermine the Tibetan freedom movement and to kill the spirit of resistance to assimilation. So his words are, for sure, for all these years, the government has forced people from Tibetan areas, etc., to move to cities, which is the focus on, of the paper. Uh, to let, has let Chinese settle down in Tibetan areas, has controlled our nationality and the use and spread of our writings, has exerted control on freedom of religion. In brief, this is a long-term plan to weaken the freedom movement among Tibetans and Uyghurs and to wipe it out. I don't know if you are as surprised as me by the um, openness or frankness or um, directness of this piece of political opinion. Uh, it's quite unusual to find this on the internet and usually it doesn't stay for a long time. Most of the time, though, indictment of the Chinese state policies come under the literary garb of poems or lyrical prose or films. And this is what I will turn to now. But then a little bit of uh, background. I, I don't think you need to see a, a map of <laughs> where Tibet is, how it is, in, it is divided into... Well, we have Nepal specialists, so how it is, it is divided into... <laughs> Uh, into um, regions and provinces, and uh, this is a clumsy superimposition of the um, nomadic uh, areas in the uh, whole of Tibet. So until 1950, um, grassland resources were community-based and they were managed in a traditional way. Uh, I won't go into that. Uh, then in the 1950s, uh, the CCP's people uh, Tibet people, uh, sorry, the CCP's People Liberation Army came to Tibet and implemented gradually state and provincial level policies. So um, Eastern Tibet, where most of the authors I'll be talking about today, and I think it's no coincidence, Eastern Tibet nomadic areas uh, were forcefully incorporated into a new state and new political logic. They were collectivized. There was massive uprising, which is still understudied in 1958 in Amdo, uh, the northeast part of Tibet, and it um, provoked a large-scale trauma upon Tibetans there. Then in the post-60s, all over Tibet, communes were settled, established. So this shows you it's not exactly, uh, we don't have visual representation for what happened then. But this comes from the Tibet Mirror, a Tibetan newspaper which was published in Kalimpong, in, uh, and um, which shows the bombing of a Chaching monastery, 1956. And then Tibetan herders, Tibetan pasture land were incorporated into the Chinese state and administration, and which was supposed to bring liberation and progress. And I don't think I need to go into details about that. Then uh, came the Cultural Revolution, the end of the Cultural Revolution. Uh, and in the 1980s, uh, communes were dismantled, uh, collectivization was stopped, and people were given, given families were given what is called uh, household responsibility system. Uh, so it's not exactly a return to pre-1950s herding organization practices, but uh, it, Tibetan herders returned to a mode of living which was closer, closer to what they had known before the 1950s. There were few innovations like winter houses, year-round habitats, and fencing of pasture land. I don't need to go into details. Now I'm going to go into the, the heart of my, my presentation. So in the 1980s, 1990s, Tibetan language literature, uh, when you read poetry, poems, novels, all you, you found quite a lot of references to grassland, pastoralism, herders, and black tent. But it was, uh, they had no special status. It was like an, I call it infra-ordinary artifact. And the grassland too, as well as the tent, was an infra-ordinary background. Moreover, it was either celebrated as an ethnic marker of an authentic way of Tibetan life, especially for Tibetans who hail from these areas, or it was seen as the place where nothing happens, as we will see, or it was condemned as the locus of backwardness and ruthlessness. 
uh, with many clan feuds and vendettas, which justified state and com Chinese Communist Party intervention and use of legitimate violence. For instance, for those of you who are familiar with Tibetan uh, contemporary literature, one of the first short stories that got to be published right after the Cultural Revolution uh, is by the very famous Tendrup Gyel, um, uh, who died in 1955, and Tendrup Gyel wrote a short piece uh, called Dong Tak Tang, The Plain of the Wild Yak and the Tiger, about the rivalry between two uh, neighboring um, nomadic groups. Um, a young man from one group, a young woman from another group fall in love. It doesn't please, it doesn't happen to please the elders and their fight. Uh, because um, the, Tendrup Gyel was trying to promote um, free, well, um, to, to, no, sorry, to um, denounce forced marriage and to show the backwardness also, to, um, the backwardness of uh, Tibetan nomads and Tibetans in general when it comes to love. And the story ends with the intervention of the local Communist Party secretary, I would call it a communist happy hand, when, uh, which was almost compulsory at that time in the publication in the early 1980s. So that's, here's one little piece of poetry. By the way, we will be reading some um, poetry translated into English uh, quite a lot during this presentation. So um, this uh, poet, poem was written one day in the tent, in 19, was published in 1994, might have been written before that. It was written by Zhu Kesang. Zhu Kesang is one of the foremost Tibetan uh, cadres, highly educated in Tibetan uh, history and language, and I will slow, uh, more rapidly talk about him a little bit later because he would come back in the topic, in the talk. What did Zhu Kesang write in his poem? Uh, so it's like one day in the tent. The meadow has put on its clothes. Yellow specks of smoke have fallen slowly on the extraordinary accounts of the upper community, community lama and the dakini of the community below. Grandmother's prayer wheel neither slows down nor accelerates. It turns and turns again. In this serene and solitary moment, a slight boredom, escorted by the snow, dotes the ropes and scatters on the ground. The head of the family concludes, the otter trim on Tundrupso's garment is two fingers longer than that of the, on her elder sister's. The old herder's tired snorings follow each other and increase by the hour. So what, do we, what picture do we get from this one day in the tent? Boring, boredom, snoring, old age, slowness, futility of daily concerns and conversations, uh, pettiness. Uh, they dominate the poem of uh, Zhu Kesang. And it's, it represents quite well the mood uh, or the way how, the, way how the, the tent and the nomadic environment was repeated, represented then. But then things accelerated in the 19, uh, in, uh, 2000. Um, there were many new reforms, economic and social reforms, uh, which I won't go into detail here, but just, you know, this, this is to give you uh, just an idea of how the um, herding communities were affected, or, uh, strongly affected by um, ensuing policies, uh, aiming at resettling them in peri semi urban uh, settlements, as you can see here. So, on the part of the Chinese state, uh, you can if you look at the official publications, um, everything is, you know, has improved. Tibetans now live in a beautiful and new area, which is nice and cookie cut. It looks much neater and nicer and cleaner than uh, the previous camps of the of the nomads. And um, if you read whatever is being published in, um, in officially in China today, um, you know you will find that there's an agreement in the way that uh, nomadic life <coughs> and um, was represented in the 1980s and 90s by Tibetans themselves in their literature and the way that it is being represented now in the official <coughs> uh, publications. Uh, slowness, uh, backwardness, uh, cut, being cut off from uh, contemporary reality, these are the topics that are recurrent. But then we reach what I call chapter two, 
to the best of my knowledge, and I may be wrong, but the U-turn in terms of representation of herding and the black tent can be dated to 2006, quite accurately. That year, the very same author whom uh, I just mentioned, Ju Kesan, who was born in a nomadic area in the 1960s. He graduated from Central Institute of Foreign Nationalities. He has a master's degree from Qinghai Nationality Institute. So he was, he's among the highly educated Tibetans of his generation. He's the director of the nationality section of the Golok Prefecture Translation Bureau. So he has a high uh, state position. And he has published many books and poems. So here he is on the left. Ju <coughs> uh, published uh, a six-page text of a highly, li highly literary prose in the uh, Dongchar magazine, which is a well-established official literary magazine published in Qinghai province. I must confess that I did read it at that time, or a little bit later, but I think I was completely unable to grasp the, the meaning that was hidden behind this text, or not hidden, as much as not available to me, I couldn't decipher what he met, meant at that time. And the text does make a lot of sense a few la years later. Um, so what does he say? He, in his text called uh, Farewell to the Tent, he's witnessing with disbelief the farewell to the black tent. So he says, that's how it starts. I give absolutely no credence to the rumors that you are going away now, leaving Tibetans where they are. I give no more credit to those who say that you are going to leave us by breaking your ropes without even an announcement to the land of snow. You will definitely go. You're already moving away. The big ones are moving with jerks. The little ones are moving with humility. They are disappearing one after the other. His writing is highly emotional. It's quite lengthy, it's six pages long, it's very lyrical, and it shows a strong symbiosis between Tibetans and their tent. Oops, sorry. Huh. So here's, a, I, you know, I just show you a few extracts. Since the blood of Tibetans is mingled with your tent, the joys and sorrows of Tibetans are united with yours. The destiny of Tibetans is one with you, and you are the Tibetans have offered the same prayers in the land of snows. This is why no love is stronger than the love I feel for you, and no commitment is higher than the commitment I hold for you. Um, we can read in these six pages, which are, to my uh, feeling anyway, extremely beautiful, the hint at the imperative of modernity as possibly one main cause behind the parting of the tent, or the, far, the, the, the farewell to the tent. You must definitely quit this world at the crossroads between old and new eras. And when you will have finished your long wandering in the highlands, is it true, as they say, and we can wonder who is this they, that you will become a pretty tale like the happenings of old? And although the, the, um, the text is very, it's quite emotional, um, it's more love feeling that exudes from the text and not so much, uh, the, it seems to me, the inner feeling of the narrator. But if you, they, they are transposed on the, te on the tent. When you are going, where are you going with this sad look? So why are you living in fear? Why should I accompany you unwillingly? And this is when he gives his opinion about the, uh, the leaving of, uh, of the tent. Um, sorry. <clears throat> So as you can see, his representation of the black tent and nomadic community, of course, you haven't read the whole text, but I have, and I can guarantee that his uh, gaze, upon, gaze upon the tent has completely changed. From a dull, intemporal artifact, he has become a conflict-free, idealized, organic whole with which the narrator, I guess it's Zhu Kesang, enjoys a perfect relationship in which Tibetans live a conflict-free, harmonious, enlightened existence. He doesn't clearly uh, explain to the reader why the departure of the tent is irreversible, although it says it is. And you can understand that it's very unexpected. The narrator keeps feeling um, surprised and asking the tent why it is leaving. Um, it looks almost, maybe when I first read it, I thought it was almost like a natural disappearance. I couldn't grasp the meaning. Now I think I, I gradually understand. 
uh, why he didn't go into details. Um, so for the sake of brevity, I will only focus now on nine poems that I have been able to gather online uh, in, in the last four to five years, and they only represent the tip of the iceberg of poems which deal with the black tent. Um, they show the same passion for the black tent as Juke Sang's poem, often anthropomor anthropomorphizing it, addressing it directly using honorific language. Uh, but they contrast in one important thing with Ju Kesang's poem, because they, currently, they openly contest current policies of settlement. And in spite of their formal diversity, I have been struck to find a number of similar, similar themes from one poem to the other. Most poems are so loaded that it's often difficult to isolate one or two little lines and one theme of its own. So I will try to give a few topics that are recurrent from one poem to the other for you to, uh, to get a flavor. So something which is striking is that these new poems, let's call them the new poems, um, often resort to childhood memories. Childhood memories is not a very widely practiced literary genre on the part of Tibetan writers. So why, we can ask, we, can, we may wonder why they resort to this in the case of the, of the tent. Well, most writers have spent their childhood under the tents, but this is not enough. I think it gives a, a pretense of authenticity, of intimacy, and it's also it's based on emotions and more than on analysis. So it can be shared by many readers, uh, which which the, who can relate to, um, to the text more easily. So Ju Kesang, actually I have to put Ju Kesang here because he also use, resorts to childhood memories or the narrator's childhood memories. It is under the skirt of your robe that my little body fell gracelessly among men. It is your shelter that my hesitant little legs first explored, surfing on the waves of the samsara. It is also inside you that I, my small mind through the first lassos of its gaze heard pounding heart pounding. And then a more recent one. One night, as I lay between my dad and mum, waiting for sleep, I looked at the sky, uh, uh, sorry, I looked at the st stars twinkle through the star hole in the roof and felt that everyone was moving swiftly. Every one of the stars was moving swiftly, like the eyes of children who cannot fall asleep. I wandered into a dream as I, was, as I listened to my father tell me the story of the poor youth, youth and the rich young maiden. And this generated many comments on the internet how this, these few lines had provoked, made emerge a lot of warm feelings and nice uh, childhood memories in the minds of the readers. Ah, I won't. So apart from these childhood memories, we have more um, contentious content. First, I can read in most of the poems a questioning of the need for settlement to begin with, with and the means that are used uh, to settle people. So here's Kawanying Chak. When I sit by the table and reflect, the strings of my brethren's biographies untied, biographies of all size, I do not see their backs shivering and shriveling in the cold of the tempest. I do not see their cheekbones cracked and red in the cold of the blizzard. I do not see the fear and panic in their eyes every dark and rainy night. Uh, so one of the rationale of uh, settlement is to improve comfort in, uh, we, in, under a, a proper house, in a proper house, and this is being questioned by Kawan Yingchak. Bung Tak Rilu, who we, whom we will uh, meet a little bit later, Bung Tak Rilu uh, says that grassland owes its beauty to the, castle, the cattle and men owe their longevity to the tent. So long life is thanks can be uh, attributed to living under a tent, not medicine, not science, uh, is the adequation between man and his environment that uh, provokes uh, longevity. And he, he also has um, a, a short, a, a very small hint at the education into accepting uh, the rationale behind the settlement. Uh, uh, education that was uh, given to national members of uh, nationalities. Of course, here we mean they, he means Tibetans, and he says nationalities have been educated for, for uh, 14 years. Pain and suffering have suffused suffused my heart for just as long. Uh, so, as you can see, there's a strong resistance on the rationale and reasons given for the 
uh, for the resettlement. Uh, many authors also question the quality of resettlement housing. Uh, here's Bongta Rilu again. He's a teacher, by the way. I was born in a Tibetan valley. I'm content with a mountain, a river, and a forest. I was born in a little dark tent. A pole and a beam are warm enough. A stone and earth house was traded to us. But in the slightest earthquake, it is a killing machine. So this, um, uh, this issue of the fear of the house that might collapse above your head is present in many poems. It can be, of course, linked to the fact that Tibetans and nomads are not used to sleeping uh, under tents. It can also be a hint to the poor quality used uh, as materials for building the, uh, the houses. Um, not only that, but the consequences, you know, the reasons, the actual uh, making, and the later phase, the consequences of development or settlement are also, they are often intermingled. Uh, this questioning comes up in several poems. Uh, here is our one uh, women, women poet of the day, Kawal Hamo. She is not the only one in Tibet, but she's, she's quite strong on this topic. And here's what she writes. It's a poem called Changes, and she's being sarcastic about, you know, changes are supposed to be development, development is supposed to be good, and she's uh, presenting her own version of changes that have occurred in her nomadic settlement. And she said, thanks to this coal mine, a macadam road cuts straight across the center of the community. Sister Droma's leg got broken. Uncle Tempa lost his life. Little Tarlo became an orphan. Uh, she refers to uh, lorries uh, that, you know, that go on the road very often and do not pay attention to the inhabit local inhabitants who are not used to uh, seeing these uh, big trucks passing by every day. And Bongta Grilu, again, uh, he's very sarcastic about the consequences. The many greenhouses erected straight in Puhu Plain, which is where, which is where he comes from, uh, mean herders do not have to herd their cattle in the mountain any longer. And now all of them have begun to spend their life joyously singing merry songs. Now all of them have begun to spend their life joyously talking idly. And now all of them have begun to spend their life joyously drinking alcohol. Which is uh, uh, a fear that many Tibetans entertain about uh, alcoholism being uh, spreading in these uh, settlement areas. Uh, so this is just a big, not only not really the beginning, but many problems are being raised in these uh, in these uh, poems. Uh, environmental issues, of course, is a big question. So, Nakpo, 2012. Once in town, wait for death in the chemical breeze. Wait for death while fearing earth, water, fire, and wind. Nangwataye. Uh, Oh, dear black tent, is it true that in the land that was ours, and I won't you know, go into too much detail about the land that was ours, which is quite eloquent, in, that in the land that was ours, we used to drink from uncontaminated rivers that, and that our mountains were unstayed by heaps of dusts. He refers to development projects that contaminate water, especially mineral, search for mineral uh, mining. Pongtarilu again, little by little, row, rows upon rows of houses of gray shackles and later buildings have been built upon Kangur Mountain's shoulder, maiming and amputating the mountain so we here have the, uh, it's a living creature, and frightening away wild animals who once teemed in the area but now are nowhere to be seen. Um, another question that uh, is being raised often in this poem is the new habitus, how to make a transition to new habitus uh, as far as privacy, for instance, and food, as we will see. Uh, upon returning from your ancient herders camp, sorry, this is the context, you cross the bridge again and arrive in a colorful white and red village. Someone sees you every day from the multi-storied house painted in white. Someone looks at you at all time from the curtainless windows. So the regime of intimacy has changed and they have to adapt. Uh, Yagbu Patsel, 2010, I do not wish to experience joys and sorrows and trusting myself upon a shack. Well, it's not a house, it's a shack for him. Thus, I don't want a house, I don't want a locker, I don't want a key. I will be content with a small brown tent that can host the wind and the snow as my guests. Nakpo 2012, go to the city, go to the city and feed yourself on grass, go to the city and feed yourself on bugs. So what does he mean here? <laughs> um, 
grass refers to vegetarian food or non-meat non, uh, food, which uh, can be part of the diet of the Chinese people. And bugs is also refers also to small animals that are being part of the uh, Chinese diet, but not of the Tibetans. So this is an idea that the city is Chinese, and you get used to eating Chinese food. And then you have a very important question, the ultimate aim of this settlement policy. And in one poem, Menzom, 2012, what do we read? When the wind is freezing, we can indeed light a fire in the small room. When the rays of the sun are scorching hot, we can indeed welcome the breeze in the little corridor. Is this house the making of the two hands of God or, and there's a space, the last stop before death? So, um, you may wonder what, uh, what death uh, Menzom is talking about. It could, be, um, it could be a hint to the soon, the, the announced collapsing of the house, which seems to be a great concern and it has to be due to the poor quality of materials. It can also be uh, the decline of, uh, this, of this community uh, living in, new, in a new environment or despair leading to death, it's not clear. Um, more even more interesting, I think, it question the definition of modernity by the, by the use of uh, quotation marks. Macpo says, pay homage to and be friend with the modern, prostitute and discard traditions. So who has set the criteria to decide what is modern and what is tradition? Even Ju Song, 2006, quite mellow in his comment writes, I'll balk from letting you go out of conservatism and in the name of all habit. So uh, you know that usually the trope about Tibetans is that they are con um, and Tibetan herders are conservative and uh, attached to tradition. So here you have these poets, uh, these poets who question uh, the very notion of what is being modern. Then you have many, many, many references to time. Um, Tibet Tibetan poets make claims uh, often to recall the historical, historically sedimented hi memories associated with the tent and its location. And one of the most recurrent words associated with the black tent is ancestor. Mepo um, Usually when uh, um, the this uh, mantra-like repetition of the manifold generation occupation of space and therefore occupation of space by, oh, sorry, and then we'll see that, sorry, uh, just a second. So here's the first extract, oh dear black ten. so he's addressing the black, I, I wrote dear because he uses honorific, you know, Danak la, so oh dear black ten. is it true that long, long ago the clatter of our conquering horses' hoofs was heard by two thirds of the world? that the banner of our fame extended over the four continents. So his, uh, the, the tent is a witness to glorious past and uh, enables them, enable uh, the authors to, uh, to claim occupation of space and mastery of space, but actually uh, there's no such thing. Dear black tent, what a defeat has befallen us, what an epidemic has contaminated us in the bend of the century. So he's talking about the early 2000s. And here there's a small glimpse at the future, which is extremely unusual, and I re re return to that. The hopes of 10,000s of years have faded. The once familiar crowd strolling on the bar core has changed. Obviously, he's referring at, I guess, Chinese tourists uh, um, circling the bar core, occupying the Tibetan space in Lhasa. The pure land of the old woman's tale is gone. Nothing is left but a sky full of black clouds and a railway, that venomous snake. Snake, sorry. Um, and then space is also uh, a constant uh, concern of the poets. Um, Bongta Grilu, again, um, writes about house building, state building, and state making. He talks still about his Kangyur Krag, uh, Krag when, he was it, uh, when he was born, where he was born. He says, at some point, by the very thick mountain, by the very pure river, by the very lofty meadow, they began to erect cotton tents with government inscribed on them. 
think everybody understands. And a few years later, they turned the cotton tents into gray houses. And a few years later, these gray houses became gray villages. And a few years later, these gray villages became gray sky skyscrapers. Now the Pulu, Puhu Plain, as described by my grandfathers, is a lost dream. Um, there are ethnic hints in these poems, not that many. Some, most of them are um, to be guessed by the, by the reader. And here is an ironic uh, view on Chinese people by Bong Tagrilu. Uh, when the bus made a stop, I thought of Tibetans who, going through this crag, would cast small wind horses, lungta, along with prayers. I thought of Chinese who, going through this crag, would cast their warm pea with joy. <laughs> <laughs> so you have the desecration of uh, sacred space due to the uh, uh, ignorance of its value by alien occupants. It can be also exclusivist, if I may use this word. Uh, in my nomadic community, there are black tents, not the white cotton tents of the Muslims. In my, in my nomadic community, there are black tents, not the blue cotton tents of Tsina, and Tsina is Maha Tsina, it's China. In my nomadic community, there are black tents, not the green cotton tents of the army. Uh, and finally, you you have a feeling of collective linguistic anxiety which pervades the poems. Once again, Bung Tagrilu, in Karngur Krag, although I found it hard to sing a little song of solace for myself, I prostrated three times and say three prayers for the sake of the prayer flagpoles whose life force had not yet disappeared in, sp in spite of the blowing wind and in the land which still bears its own name in spite of the movement of time. Uh, here it's kind of easily uh, decodable. Uh, the life force, uh, the, the blowing wind are the changes of time. Uh, the movements of times are changes and also the current policies. And it refers to the denaming and renaming of many Tibetan places by which uh, China uh, makes stay, uh, Tibetan territory part of its uh, territorial um, sc scope. And Jukya Songs was also in his 2006 plea to the tent uh, quite um, specific about this. And this he wrote, and then your Kongma and Zun Tikrop and Katsup and your Chadrang and your Saju and your Pursung, we are the only ones on earth to master the numerous terms that are specific to you, the black tent. So if you depart from us without a backward glance, with whom will we use these terms? terms? Who will listen to us, to, uh, to them, sorry. So as you can see, the mood in Tibetan poems is quite, uh, it's univoc. Uh, there, are, there is not much contestation, much contest about, you know, everybody's criticizing, everyone is criticizing the settlement process with all that it entails. So what about films? Um, I won't be showing, me, showing many extracts, film extracts for, uh, to you um, because I don't have that many films available. Uh, I, can, I will show you three. First, we should note that the first, I referred to the first Tibetan film made in Tibet dating 2004. And for those of you who, who, who know Pema Tseten, it's the first film, he, he, a student film, made upon completing his studies at the Beijing Film Academy. And he, as it happened, he chose uh, as a title and set prop for his uh, film, uh, The Grassland. So, but this is, to me, iconic Tibet for external cons consumption. This, this film was not meant really for Tibetans, whereas the poems that we've seen before are meant for Tibetans' consumption. But, okay, maybe he set a precedent. Anyway, in the last, since 2009, we've seen a flourishing, amazing number of films made by Tibetans on the Tibetan plateau, uh, low budget, not always good quality, uh, that take a uh, nomadic background as, um, as a core component of the film. So here are just a few, I don't think maybe you've seen these images so much, so I can show you just a few of them. And they, you see, you know, they always put forward 
uh, nomadic life in the in their presentation. So two films are of interest. Dong Chuk's a film, a film called uh, Borsim Bedranak, The Lost Black Tent. Uh, I've, uh, with, I've put arrows and you can, I don't know if it's very clear, but they point at nomadic settlements. Uh, the guy who was to be a herder uh, cries in despair looking at this nomadic settlement and the last scene shows him praying literally praying and begging uh, the, bla the black tent to return. He goes back to the last place where his family set up the tent and he almost cries and, and cries to the top of his voice, shouts and calls for the tent to come back. Well, of course, it doesn't come back. I don't have, I, I was trying to find it, but uh, for some reason it has disappeared from uh, uh, all possible uh, websites that used to uh, accommodate or host it. Um, and then uh, the one I can show you maybe, I don't know, how much time do I have left? 20 minutes, uh, 10 minutes. Um, I'm sorry, because my, uh, I have, I, yes, here it is. So this is just to show you how the black tent is shown in, uh, in these semi-amateur Tibetan films. And this is the beginning of a film called Sasu Ki Mengra, The Wailing at Dust. And I don't know if it has sound. It should have. So this is a story about uh, revenge and a sad love story between two lovers in a nomadic camp. And the other one I can show is The Promise, uh, which begins also with, you know, views of grassland. Sorry, the definition is not very good, but... Okay, I will stop here. It's just to show you that a nomadic background features prominently in many, many films, much more than um, it could be expected. More than half of the uh, films show a nomadic background. And now I will end showing you an extract of a film which is still in the making. Uh, by Dukar Tserang. So just a word about Dukar Tserang. He's the sound editor for Pema Tseten, the professional filmmaker who has emerged uh, from Tibet in the last 10 years. And he's starting to make, he's a musician, he's making his own films now. And this is a documentary film that he's been making for two years. It's about, it's a, it's a documentary film had his own grandmother and uh, a cousin of his uh, the grandmother, as well as the whole nomadic community to which they belong, uh, is sure that her grandson, who, who we will see in the film, is the reincarnation of her late husband. So there are many hints, many memories uh, given by the child when, uh, when he was just about to, to, to talk, many interviews of the child, of the of the young man who remembers his childhood neighbors, who says how it was striking that uh, he would remember his previous life. So, and it's also about this transition between this old grandmother who is still... <laughs> Two minutes, okay, okay, my God. <laughs> so you just see for yourself. 
And but the film, I wanted to show three minutes. So this is the father of the of the young boy and the mother and the sister. And thus the film ends, so with a very uh, dull prospect, uh, the life of this new generation of nomads who are said, and you can see that Guru cannot blow in the conch. And um, so I, I have to stop here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I can, I had six points of conclusion, so I just make one. So I suggest that uh, the black tent is, uh, just a second, uh, what we can call an antonomagia, so for the Tibet. Predicting, the fate of Tibet is predicted through uh, that of the black tent, and it represents Tibetan and Tibetans. Uh, the first dis disappearance of these black tents and the nomadic communities uh, be they chronicled by uh, poem, uh, poets in words or by filmmakers, as in the case of Dukat Serang, as you can see, obviously, does not celebrate the end of this uh, way of life or in the entry into a modern or a developed way of life, but it's much to the opposite, the occasion of a self-reflective analysis that boils down to the fear of a similar fate that awaits Tibetans, all of them, farmers, urbanites, and nomads, doomed by a type of development they feel powerless to counter and in its implementation and characteristic. And Bongtak Rilu writes quite uh, plainly 
Discarding one's cattle and tent is the portent of the decline of the land of snow. Tra Tibetan traditions are nearing the end, but not the flow of my tears, which is still long. And maybe I can just uh, stop here. Uh, quoting one last time, Zhu Ke Sang's 2006 piece. It might seem strange to a Western audience that he linked uh, the fate of the tent with that of Tibetan language, but I think this is also one of the big anguishes or anxieties of Tibetans. And what is, that's the very last uh, part, final words of his uh, essay, Farewell to the Tent, and he says, promise me something, please, if I come back here, 80 years from now, grant me that I may call you by shouting out your name three times. And I also pray that I will still be able to know how to write in your name in Tibetan. So this is, I think, with this, I will wrap up my talk. And uh, I have no conclusion because I had you know, a few more pages to go. Thank you very much for your attention. Francoise, please do, if you're willing to take a few questions. Um, mm. That was an enormously poignant and moving presentation, I think, for all of us working in the region, whether in the northern parts of Tibet or in Nepal, Bhutan, northern India. Uh, many of these themes are current mm -hmm. in all the areas mm -hmm. we work in, memory, landscape, belonging, and language. So with that, I would like to ask if there are any questions for Francoise. We're eager to have a conversation here, and we have a couple of revolving, revolving roving microphones. I'm really intrigued about the use, the number of the poems that are coming through the internet and wonder what you think the relationship between poetry that circulates on the internet and the, the widespreadness of the internet uh, as, as opposed to poetry or song or things that people might be actually um, performing or circulating through other ways. Uh, internet has brought a huge impetus to Tibetan language and um, the Pe Tibetan people. I mean, this was one of my this was one of my points. Is that writing poetry is a you know a way in disguise of writing social critics, which is quite obvious in the present circumstance. And it would just take a whole team of people scrutinizing the internet every day to look at all the poems that are being published online. And I have here, if I may, uh, even commentaries to poems are written in poetic style. So here in verse, versification, so he, because, you know, there's a question that, okay, everybody agrees, there's no counter voice, everybody uh, laments the death of the black tent. Is there no one who, who has a different opinion? And I found one. <laughs> so it was in one comment, number two, in an era when the world is developing and when nothing surpasses business development, you and I, brainless Tibetans, are clinging like a dead, like a corpse, to the black tent that does not stop the wind. This is pointless. So that was the comment, and it's it's versified. It's uh, you, you know, damling yargi peuetu sans les pegi kunle You know, it's all versified, and it's quite a common feature that they would even reply writing poetry to comment upon poetry. So it's, poetry is a much more widespread mode of expression, even for today's concern, that it is in today's world in the West. I think, and the internet has really been a huge boom, and uh, mobile phones as well. Um, I'm wondering if you've engaged at all with the production of music videos and the prevalence of grassland imagery in music and how that is present in Tibetans gathering with each other and the music video always in the background. Um, that's something that I've noticed, the grassland imagery and the tent imagery popping up, and I was wondering if you've engaged mm -hmm. at all with that. Well, I'm not that familiar with the world of today's um, modern contemporary music, but it's true that uh, the grassland image is prevalent. I think it's a way um, of cultivating Tibetans' uniqueness because farming communities, there are plenties in Han China, right? Herding communities, it's completely unheard of in a Han Chinese world. So uh, Tibetans are trying to carve this space for themselves to avoid, at least to, uh, uh, not to avoid assimilation, which is, you know, beyond the carving or not carving a space for, uh, space for oneself, but at least 
showing their difference in a very striking way. And there couldn't be more striking than a nomadic community. This is one of the possible hypotheses. Tibetan ex unique culture. I think also the Tibetans are struggling with uh, rhetoric from the Chinese state, with you know China's characteristics, China's exclusive culture. And these gave ideas maybe to Tibetans. They already have a high idea of themselves as being quite unique, right, on the top of the planet and uh, with Tibetan Buddhism. But faced with a state rhetoric that emphasis, uh, emphasizes this point, they are building up on this as well. And they try to, uh, what uh, the exclusive, uh, Tibetan exclusiveness, which is, uh, just like, or exceptionalism, like Chinese are currently uh, discussing on a huge scale Chinese exceptionalism. Um, first of all, uh, it was very beautiful poetry coming out of just uh, the black tent, which is also very, very common in the mountains of my country, Bhutan. A similar fate, um, the herders are abandoning the, the traditional black tents, but the big difference, of course, here is that it is not imposition. It is not because somebody else is telling them to move somewhere else, mm -hmm. but rather, mm -hmm. you know, the, the cheap tarp, the, the light blue tarp that, that you mm -hmm. now see dotting the mountainsides mm -hmm. is much cheaper. Mm -hmm. You can, you know, a li little child can pack it up and take it when the family moves. Whereas, you know, the bigger tent, it takes, you know, uh, years to, to weave. Mm -hmm. It's very mm -hmm. heavy. And, you know, and as farm labor, as more kids get educated, they move out of the mountains and they go to schools. Families are left with less people, you know, hurting the yaks. So, so it's, it's a different parallel. Um, I'm just wondering how, you know, in, in, in the landscape that you, that you work in, is that a common, common feeling that everybody shares, that you lament the loss of this, this tent? I mean, it, it is certainly beautiful and poetic and all that. Um, but I mean, mm. in our case, in, in Bhutan, yeah, yeah. it's a slightly different scenario. You mm. know, it, we as outsiders find it sad that, that, that now the mountains are dotted yeah, with yeah, this yeah. ugly looking plastic, you know, uh, tarp. Mm -hmm. uh, however, the, yeah. the reality of economics, the reality of, of changes in society is, is demanding something different. Mm -mm. So, no. it's, uh, again, it's, it's, a, it's a different parallel. I, I'm, I'm just curious as to, to mm. from your uh, observations, you mm -hmm. know, whether is that, if that's a common theme mm -hmm. that you see across, or is there also a big section of that, that society that is saying, let's move on you know, mm -hmm. as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. so, I mean, certainly different. Yes, you have made several points here. Um, first, um, it's true that there's a kind of ambivalence on the part of the authors because they all came from this background and they've all left it. So it's easy to lament the loss of this background uh, once you have left it. Um, the other thing is, and I wanted to quote Emilie's, um, I think, catchphrase, uh, it's, I think, as you said, the background is different. And to me, it's a, ref a refusal or reluctance on the part of Tibetans to accept uh, the, the gift of development, a Chinese-led development. So uh, were it, as in Bhutan, I guess, uh, on a voluntary basis, and it, it, it is in sometimes, uh, it has been in sometimes, some occasions, um, it might not trigger so many poems. It's, it's just, a f it is the, um, it crystallizes the big anxiety of seeing not only, as I said, the black tent or nomadic communities disappear, but the language, the language meaning the Tibetan nationality altogether, Tibetans. So uh, it's, it's like an excuse to talk about politics without talking about politics. And it's an excuse about being powerless on your own territory and having to go through a development, a development pr uh, process that you have no word in, you have no saying in. Thank you, Francois, so much for such a beautiful and powerful talk. Um, with all of this, with, with all these beautiful descriptions of the black yak hair tent, I kept thinking yeah. of the other kind of tent, which is the white cotton tent, yeah. which I associate maybe wrongly more with central Tibet and with like garden parties and picnics and things like that. And I wonder if that's an image that you find at all in the literature that you're looking at. Not at all. No, so that I'm has no, no kind of cachet at all. In no, you see, here in one of the poems that I quoted, it's associated the Muslims. 
And I think it's because of the white and the whiteness and the white cap that they wear, because I don't think Muslims have uh, white tents anyway, as far as I know. <laughs> uh, so it would be more like the association of the color. Uh, but they are not. They don't celebrate this tent as much as uh, uh, the the black one. A final question, perhaps, just to pair up. Um, thank you, Francois. This has been absolutely, um, I mean, just very fascinating. The the question I have is, where uh, are the animals in all of this? And uh, it, it was more um, mm. evident when you put up the films, mm -hmm. and then we saw mm -hmm. Yak and Dri and Zoma. Mm -hmm. But in the poems, um, is there a romantic lament or an elegy also for the disappearance of, of, of animals? Hmm. And I'm thinking also kind of in, in the context of exile, in, in many of the interviews that I've done, I get a, um, a real loss of nostalgia and a yearning for horses. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know necessarily where which animals might appear in the poetry, mm -hmm. but I guess I was wondering if you could speak to that. It just seems so uh, specific, mm -hmm. the, the elegy again for the, for the tent, mm -hmm. um, and yeah, where yeah. do animals appear? They, they, often, they often mention uh, the yak hair from which uh, the tent is made, and the, the wholesome of the process, you know, yak tents, uh, yak roaming on the territory and, and their hair creating the tent. But they don't talk about, about so much about the cattle. That's a very good point. I never thought about it. <laughs> but Pema Tseten's last film called Old Dog is really an interesting film on the symbiotic relation between dog and sheep and people. You know, it's the mastiff. Uh, the big dogs and how it has become a um, market, upmarket, um, nouveau riche accessoire and accessory. And it's all around the relationship between the man and uh, the animal. And I think it's quite new as far as I know in uh, art production, at least films production. On that note, and I realize that um, I'm in the awkward position of breaking up the wonderful discussion that we're hoping to have this day, but some of you may be nostalgic for coffee. And I'd like to thank Francoise for a deep, probing, and challenging presentation that has got all of us thinking. What a wonderful way to start. Francoise, thank you. Thank you.